This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to Guantanamo, where hunger-striking prisoners say U.S. military officials have threatened to stop force-feeding them and are denying them basic medical care in a move the prisoners and their lawyers say threatens to kill them. In an op-ed for The Guardian, hunger-striking Guantanamo Bay prisoner Khalid Qasim writes, quote, They have decided to leave us to waste away and die instead. Now, as each night comes, I wonder if I will wake up in the morning. When will my organs fail? When will my heart stop? I'm slowly slipping away and no one notices, end quote. Qasim has been in prison for 15 years without being charged with a crime and writes that a hunger strike was, quote, the only peaceful way I thought I could protest. He is one of 41 men remaining in Guantanamo. Ten were charged or convicted before a commission, but the rest are being held in indefinite wartime detention without trial. Human rights lawyers have long opposed force feeding in Guantanamo, saying the brutal way it's implemented is akin to torture. But those same lawyers say they oppose the sudden suspension of fees meetings and basic medical care, since their client's health is precariously declining, and such care may mean the difference between life and death. The international legal charity Reprieve is now calling on supporters to join a solidarity hunger strike with the prisoners. Among those who've heeded the call are British Labour Party MP Tom Watson, Pink Floyd co-founder Roger Waters, comedian Sarah Pascoe, actor David Morrissey, director and actor Mark Rylance, and French-born actress Caroline Lagerfeld. For more, we go to London, where we're joined by human rights lawyer Clive Stafford-Smith, founder and director of the international legal charity Reprieve, which represents eight Guantanamo prisoners. Clive Stafford-Smith, welcome to Democracy Now! Why don't you lay out what's happening, what people may remember during the Obama years is the force-feeding that prisoners called inhumane. They called it torture. Um, now explain what's happening. I will, and good morning to everyone. Back under President Obama, we had force-feeding, which there's a large swathe of the medical community that says that that's unethical per se. But the way it was done and is done in Guantanamo Bay is gratuitously painful. Uh, General Brent Craddock said in The New York Times, that they were making it inconvenient, his word, by making it more painful. Well, just recently, starting on September the 20th, we learned that President Trump's team down there have added a pernicious twist. So what they're doing now is they've stopped force-feeding the prisoners for now, and they've said to the prisoners that the, the prisoners can go forward and they can starve themselves until their organs fail until they get serious mental illness, until they go blind. And at that point, they're going to start force-feeding them again to stop them from actually dying. So they wait until they're half dead and then keep them half alive and then keep them forever at the cost of $11.8 million per prisoner in Guantanamo Bay. What's the justification for that? I mean, why, why do this to them now? Well, the wheeze behind it, I'm afraid, is they're trying to coerce the prisoners out of their peaceful protest. Uh, and, you know, this is just wrong. Imran Khan, the well-known Pakistan politician who's a strong supporter of Ahmed Rabani, one of my clients, has written in The Washington Post today that there's a long tradition that we as Americans have for peaceful protest. And the idea that the Trump administration would try to bully these guys who have been on hunger strike for four years asking for just one thing, you know, give me freedom or give me a fair trial, that they should use this sort of medical malpractice to bully people out of it is just disgusting. So tell us the story of your clients, um, Ahmed Rabani and Khalid Hassan, if you can quickly tell us, to give us a sense of who are these 41 men who remain languishing at this U.S. prison in Cuba. So there are 41 people at a cost of $500 million that could be well spent on something else. Of those, 15 of them are potentially going to have some form of trial, fair or unfair, in Guantanamo Bay. And the rest are forever prisoners who ain't going anywhere. And some of them, instead of being high-value detainees, are by definition low-value or no-value detainees. Let me just tell you about Ahmed Rabani. Ahmed, and this is all corroborated in the Senate uh, CIA torture report, uh, Ahmed was originally sold to the U.S. for a bounty by the ISI, who said he was a really bad dude called Hassan Gul. When they got him, Ahmed said, no, I'm not. I'm a 
taxi driver com from Karachi. Uh, and indeed, in the Senate report, it says, oh, you know, this is what he says, we don't believe him. He then spent 545 days in the dark prisons of the CIA torture process, including being exposed to Strapado, an old torture that was done by the Spanish Inquisition. And, you know, what did they get for that? Absolutely nothing, except they abused this poor guy beyond measure. He was then taken to Guantanamo Bay, where he patiently waited for his release back to his wife and, and son, uh, who was only 19 months at the time he was detained. And then after losing patience in 2013, he decided, what can I do? He went on a hunger strike. Uh, he, he did that, and then he was force-fed, and he's been force-fed for four years, and I've seen him down there. He is now 92 pounds, if you can believe it. He's just a shadow of his former self. And there he is. And Halid Mohammed, in some ways, is even worse. Halid, you know, I've known him for some years. He is absolutely nobody. I hate to say that. It sounds, you know, like I'm disparaging him. I'm not. But he is absolutely nobody from Yemen, and yet he's still in Guantanamo also. So you say that Ahmad uh, Rabani now weighs uh, 92 pounds. So at what point uh, uh, will he start being uh, uh, force-fed again? Because the idea is, as you pointed out earlier, that they don't actually want these people to die. Well, that's a good question. Because if you look at the medical literature, when you get under 30, you know, 30 percent below your normal body weight, that's when you're in real danger of dying. And he's now 33 percent below his normal body weight, and there wasn't much of him to begin with. So he is in real danger. I spoke with him yesterday in a legal phone call, this privileged call I had with him, and he's not sounding good. And indeed, there's a whole syndrome, uh, a medical syndrome of uh, hunger strikers. When you lose thiamine, you begin to get psychotic. You begin to get to where you can't make voluntary and competent decisions. And what I'm afraid, I mean, none of these guys want to die. They just want justice. But what I'm afraid with Ahmed is he's getting beyond the point where he can make sensible decisions, and he just might end up doing something really stupid and ending up dying down there. Um, you're calling on supporters to um, join in a solidarity hunger strike. Are you doing this? Can you talk about what you're calling on supporters to do and what you're calling on the Trump administration to do right now? Sure. Uh, well, look, let me first say I don't want any of you to hurt yourself medically, uh, and perhaps you shouldn't be quite as stupid as I am sometimes. I, I, was, I did five days of a solidarity hunger strike uh, just because I think it's really important when I talk to my clients that I can say, you know, we will take on your protest for now. I just want you guys to eat a little bit to keep yourself alive while we sue to stop this nonsense. And we did sue this week, and I hope to goodness the judge is going to order the government to behave themselves properly. Now, in terms of what we want, I'll, if I may, I, I, I've got some notes from yesterday. And, uh, you know, this is the message that Ahmed Rabani has for President Trump. This is a quote. What is the benefit of keeping this place open? They're spending over $500 million a year on this place. They could have saved the money, sent us away, whatever, and not have this headache. Show mercy, President Trump, if there is any in your heart. Use the money to give to your soldiers, your people, not wasting it here. Help the poor people, help the needy in the U.S. You've got fires in California, hurricanes. Use the money for that. Really, look, either just set them free or do what we've done in America for the last 200 years, which is give them a trial. And I would love to have that trial. I don't think the government would. Uh, and then we'd get them out. Well, Clive Stafford Smith, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Human rights lawyer, director of Reprieve, which represents eight Guantanamo prisoners. That does it for our show. Juan Gonzalez will be speaking at Princeton today at noon. I'll be speaking on Saturday uh, in California. We'll be broadcasting from Marin on Friday. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Special thanks to Renee Feldstein, Guzder, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, Trina Nadura. Thanks so much for joining us.